Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for each of you who joined us today for the Preventative Screenings in Early Detection webinar. My name is Teresa Evers, and I am the 2023 Live Better Committee Chair with the St. Tammany Chamber. This webinar is being recorded today and will be sent out with the slides following the session. I'll kick us off by introducing today both of the physicians who will be speaking. We'll do that um, after we watch a quick two minute video, which was done and created by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana, their healthcare economist, Mike Berto, on the value and the importance of obtaining preventative screenings. Following the quick video, we will turn it over to Dr. Hill, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Marange. Please, if anybody does have any questions, we will be monitoring the Q&A chat box today to answer at the end of the session. We appreciate your ongoing commitment of the St. Tammany Chamber. Thank you. Here in Louisiana, it makes sense to get your AC2 to the That's what I'm talking about. The first day of summer, it's a major problem, and it leaves you without cool air during the summer. It might cost you up front to do preventive maintenance, but it'll likely cost less than doing corrective maintenance. Your health works the same way. Not only can routine preventive care and screening save your life, as a healthcare economist, I can tell you they'll also save you money. Preventive care almost always costs less than corrective care. For example, the average annual cost of treatment for type 2 diabetes is nearly $10,000, while common prescriptions and science based diet and lifestyle programs cost mere hundreds per year. Likewise, preventive screenings and blood pressure medications that could prevent a stroke cost about $1,000 a year, and Blue Cross has programs that can bring that cost to zero for the most common of these drugs. Compare that to the $30,000 plus that the average stroke victim pays in the first 90 days of treatment. And the list goes on. As part of the Affordable Care Act, Insurers must cover some preventive and wellness care for health plan members, and there are a lot of them. Even if you feel healthy, it's important to have at least one checkup each year with your primary care doctor. Ask which screenings, tests, or shots, yet we still need those as adults, make sense based on your age and health history. The straight talk is it can save your life, and it will also help you save money by preventing problems before you have to prevent them. You consider going solar in Louisiana, but and so that tees us up into really today's conversation, really specifically focusing on the value and again the importance of obtaining screens um, with your physician. And so I will um, read Dr. Hill's bio, and I'll read Dr. Morange's bio, and we'll kick this off. So Dr. Michael Hale is the Vice President of the Quality and Utilization Management and Chief Quality Officer at St. Tammany Health System. He's also the St. Tammany Quality Network Medical Director. Dr. Michael Hill provides leadership in, and direction for planning and organizing and coordinating the mission of creating a successful St. Tammany Quality Network and works to advance quality care and service at St. Tammany Health System. He is also responsible for assisting in the development of physician relationships across the same network, for stimulating the growth of the organization and providing leadership in medical management by working through and with network physicians. He is seen as technical and mentoring resource to physicians. Dr. Hill has been a physician in Louisiana for close to 30 years and cared for patients in more than 10 hospitals during that time. He has held several committee and administrative roles along that way and has been elected to the Medical Executive Committee of three different hospitals with, and was the board chairman for IMG Healthcare for more than seven years. Dr. Hill received a bachelor's degree from the University of New Orleans and a medical degree from Louisiana State University Medical Center. After an internship and residency in internal medicine at Charity Hospital of New Orleans, where he was named chief resident, he went on to complete a fellowship in infectious disease in the LSU Department of Medicine. For Dr. Morange, Dr. Morange is a hematology and oncology specialist in Covington, Louisiana, and is a member of North Shore Oncology Associates. 
Dr. Morange received her medical degree at Louisiana State University of Medicine in Shreveport before completing her residency at Optioner Clinic Foundation in New Orleans. She then completed her fellowship at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. Dr. Morange is a certified by the board, American Board of Internal Medicine in Hematology and Oncology. Two um, outstanding resumes for the, both the physicians. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Hill. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, and I think the video, uh, first of all, thank you all for inviting me today because I, I love the platform talking to people about really changing the focus of healthcare and maintaining um, wellness instead of treating uh, acute sick patients. And I think the uh, we always have people who are going to get sick, and that's always what the hospital is here for. But I think St. Tammany changed its name to uh, St. Tammany Health System a few years ago to really focus on wellness and keeping people out of the hospital uh, and, and making our community better. And that's what I really deal with is population health, but I'm going to explain uh, exactly what that is and where we're, and where we're going. So our agenda today is kind of changing the focus, as I said, towards maintaining wellness uh, for our community and our patients. Uh, as that video showed, it's much uh, cheaper and less expensive, less work loss when you uh, treat uh, chronic conditions, uh, screen can for cancer and get cancers uh, detected earlier. And we talk about early cancer detection. I don't want to get into Dr. Morange's uh, area because she knows a lot more about this than I do but just a, a very brief overview from a population health um, uh, perspective. And then talking about staying connected and with the patient. And I think that's very, very important uh, because you really got to make the patient uh, an, an integral part of managing their disease. And then how do we monitor success? How do we know that what we, we're doing really does work? Uh, so really, as again, we're changing the focus uh, to a proactive approach instead of reactive, like I was changed, uh, uh, like I was uh, taught at, at Charity Hospital, where we were very reactive, but really trying to, to prevent um, uh, a visit or two or three to the uh, hospital if we can. So population health really focuses on maintaining and improving the health of the community, but if you peel back the onion, uh, you really find out that, that really it's, it's both patient-centered and community-centered. So on the community side, we wanna make sure we, we uh, have community outreach. And what I mean by that is uh, community education about um, what our resources are uh, that we can tap into for healthcare and really talk about people to, to our uh, population on how to maintain wellness how to maintain fitness. Uh, and there's, there are very many uh, different layers to that. And then of course, we wanna, wanna drill down to the patient level and everything about healthcare. And I've known Dr. Morange for a long time. I know she's the same way. We wanna be patient-centered focused. That's really important. And that includes having timely access to healthcare, not only when you need it, but routinely um, as far as monitoring uh, chronic conditions. I think primary care focused is really important. Now, um, what I mean by that is your general medical, um, da daily, weekly, yearly um, touch points should be with a primary care physician. If you develop a, um, a special condition like cancer or a heart condition that might require a cardiologist, then you may go see the oncologist, cardiologist, et cetera. But we really think primary care a primary care physician should be the quarterback that uh, then sends the patient out to the specialist when needed. And we want to really uh, focus on education and patient understanding of disease prevention. Uh, we think, as the video showed, that um, it's money in the bank when you can treat somebody early for a chronic condition, uh, detect a cancer early, um, and, and uh, also uh, deal with some of the psychosocial issues that, that we deal with, such as loneliness um, and food insecurity and other things in our, our communities. So managing chronic conditions, and this is really uh, the focus of a primary care uh, physician. 
Uh, we do know that the total cost of chronic disease when last measured by the CDC uh, two years ago is about $4 trillion. It's a leading cause of disability and death. It contributes to higher insurance premiums. From a um, worker's point of view, there's increased absenteeism as people progress down the uh, road to more uh, serious conditions due to their chronic conditions. Uh, patients get on more expensive um, farm, uh, medications, and we do know that elevated pharmaceutical costs are really hitting the health plans quite heavily right now. Uh, you know, from an employer and insurance point of view, uh, early management of chronic disease doesn't show cost savings immediately, but over time, longitudinally, over years, um, we see some significant cost benefits from uh, managing chronic illness. And this just shows, this is a dated slide, but um, really uh, holds pretty true for uh, what we see, the chronic conditions that, that Americans have. Um, high, hypertension is the number one condition, and uh, certainly many people, at least a third of the patients of the adult people who are walking around with hypertension don't even know they have it. And in some cases are even uh, areas of, of the country, there that number is even higher. Uh, many patients with lung disease like asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema is next. Then diabetes mellitus, particularly diabetes mellitus type 2, which is also called adult onset diabetes. And then heart attack, heart disease, and heart failure are certainly important. And we don't want to forget about uh, cancer because although it's a small percentage, it's a very costly uh, diagnosis and uh, one that we, um, we want to make sure that we diagnose as early as possible. And this just shows you the uh, different cost categories based on the number of conditions a patient has. Uh, and you can see inpatient cost, outpatient cost, uh, drug cost, uh, branded drug cost, and other costs based on the number of chronic conditions. Because most folks, once they um, reach a certain age, don't have one chronic condition. They may have two, three, or four. And certainly the more chronic conditions you have, the, the higher the cost, uh, yearly cost of that disease. Diabetes is a, is a good example. Um, One dollar out of every four dollars in the U.S. healthcare is cost is spent on caring for folks with diabetes. And as you saw on that previous slide, that's not even the most frequent diagnosis. That's about 10% of the population. In Louisiana, it's, it's higher. It's more like 15 to 16%. $327 billion is spent each year on direct medical costs, and $90 billion is a yearly cost on reduced productivity. Um, so again, people with diabetes have medical expenditures about twice as high as, as individuals without diabetes. So again, um, going back to the primary care model, the, fo the focus really is on wellness on nutrition, on maintaining uh, exercise. And I think lately we've been really focused on uh, social involvement. Social isolation, particularly for our older patients, is a severe uh, detriment and, and leads to a poor outcome. Uh, so I think that's something we need to be uh, uh, looking at. The um, health screening is important for the management of chronic conditions, and that's for blood pressure, diabetes, and vascular disease, just to name a few. Uh, smoking sensation is certainly very important. Uh, smoking uh, leads to all sorts of issues, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, lung cancer, heart disease, uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and probably early dementia. And one of the things I used to tell, tell some of my uh, patients when, they, when that didn't scare them enough, is it also leads to poor skin health and you get wrinkles. Maybe that that may make a difference. Limiting alcohol consumption um, certainly is important. And then we just got over Jazz Fest, so we can start talking about this again. Uh, depression screening is important. And of course, preventive care with vaccinations uh, certainly um, needs, to, needs to be thought about. The other thing that I think we'll see more of that's not on this list is genetic screening and screening for certain types of cancers. You may have heard about BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and the propensity to develop breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. Some of those screens um, certainly may be important in certain patients and that may become a more important 
uh, screening uh, modality in the future. And certainly when we uh, control chronic diseases, it decreases the risk of stroke, heart attack, end-stage kidney disease, blindness, uh, and congestive heart failure. And all of these things in total uh, may not happen in ones or twos. It may happen in in several different ways uh, if we don't manage chronic diseases early. Cancer screening and early detection is certainly important. Um, and we wanna make sure that we do early cancer detection because treatment is usually less invasive and costly. There's less time spent on treatment uh, modalities. What I mean by that is the extents, extensiveness of treatment may be lessened if you um, if you don't have metastatic disease, and I'll show you that in a minute, there's a better chance for a cure, a better worker productivity, and I'll show you that graph in a minute, and less absenteeism. So this is just a, a slide that shows you in the, in the blue, these are folks with who have cancer of any type, late stage that have metastasis versus those that have non-metastasis, and it's looking at work care, work absences, short-term and long-term disability, within 12 months after a cancer diagnosis. And you can see the earlier we detect cancer, the, the, the less costly it is to the employer as far as just looking at workplace abstinence and, and, uh, abstinence and short term disability. So what do we do with, uh, with patients? We wanna make sure that we use our, um, some new tools to uh, stay connected to patients so that they always feel like they have an avenue to, to talk to the physician if they have any concerns, uh, any symptoms, any new worries. And we have something called my chart in Epic, which will connect the patient uh, to the chart. They can look at their lab work, they can uh, text the physician at any time um, and get uh, feedback. They can schedule appointments through my chart or my Oxford activation. Digital health programs, uh, there are digital health programs around the state. Um, we do partner uh, with Oxygen for digital health programs for hypertension, COPD, and uh, diabetes mellitus. And we actually use the digital programs for our own employees because we find, again, that hypertension is better controlled when you're measuring it on a routine basis and you have a comprehensive healthcare team to manage hypertension. We also encourage yearly face-to-face -face visits with physicians because uh, we feel like that's certainly important to discuss things that you might not think about um, on a telehealth visit uh, with texting. And then telehealth is important because you may not always have the time to get to the office. Uh, you may have a, um, uh, something that comes up in the middle of a work day. And certainly telehealth provides the opportunity to uh, talk to the healthcare provider without having to maybe leave the office or the home. And then the other thing that we are really stressing in St. Tammany Health System is outreach to the home itself for people who are either can't travel or if they're just getting over a complex disease and are too uh, sick to travel um, to the office. So we are reaching out uh, to the patient in the home. And I think we'll see more and more of this. You may have read it sir, about the hospital at home program uh, and we certainly try to follow patients as they're leaving the hospital when they're at high risk for readmissions to send somebody into the home. Um, sometimes you find medications at home that you may, the patient may forget about. Uh, and you can also uh, assess the living conditions and perhaps some of the social needs of uh, the particular individual when you get into the, uh, into the home. So how do we monitor success? We have something, again, built within Epic called Healthy Planet, where we look at the population as a whole and see if we're meeting certain targets to uh, maintain um, how, how well we're doing with controlling uh, diabetes or hypertension or cholesterol. And again, these are all ways to, uh, if you control these various things, you'll control the chronic diseases we talked about earlier. So with that, I thank you for um, listening, and it's been an honor to talk to you guys today. Uh, certainly, be happy to answer any questions within the um, in the question and answer section. Thank you.
So I can go ahead and get started. Is it uh, sharing the screen? Just let me know if y'all y'all are able to see that screen. Okay, we're doing it. All right, great. All right, so like, like they said earlier, my name is Genevieve Mirage. I'm a uh, hematologist oncologist um, with North Shore Oncology Associates and Mary Bird Perkins. Um, and I, I love this topic. I thought Dr. Hill's talk was great. I think um, we make a huge impact on people's lives and just improving healthcare as a whole if we can focus on and improve preventative health and screenings. Um, and so I thought that I would focus on my perspective as a as a cancer specialist, I'm often seeing patients um, after a, a, the you know more um, advanced part in that process. They have had the screening, or they haven't, or they have had the preventative health, or they haven't. And and so, what is the real world you know experience for patients in those scenarios if they have a cancer diagnosis? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the cancer screening for the most common cancer types and those various outcomes that we see in real life and then um, kind of touch briefly on preventative health, which is so important to that too. All right, so, so cancer screening. So I, I completely agree with the points that Dr. Hill made about that. Um, diagnosing cancer early makes a huge impact on patient outcomes, the amount of treatment they need, the amount of uh, treatment that they need to go through and that may impact their health and side effects and cost of care and the amount of time it takes and psychologically, uh, you know, what they undergo to go through that. And of course, that affects the amount of time that they would be out of work and, and in terms of affecting the, um, the workplace. So if we can diagnose cancer early, that's, that's the most ideal. If we can't prevent it, let's say, let's say preventing is the most ideal. If we can't prevent it, diagnosing it early um, is what our goals are. So um, the, the good news is that though we do not have good screening tests for all cancer types, we do have good screening for the most common, the three most common, and this is over 50% of cancer diagnoses for men and women. Um, for women, um, number one is breast, number two is lung cancer, number three is colon, and for men, number one is prostate, number two is lung, and number three is colon. So I'm going to touch on all these um, most common cancers, screening, um, and, and kind of what I see in the clinic with patients who are diagnosed via screening versus if they were diagnosed without screening. Um, so, so breast cancer, um, by far the, the most common cancer for women, one in eight women get breast cancer. It's very common. Um, these incidence numbers are increasing every year. Up to 300,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in 2023. Um, and so we know that mammograms and screening imaging, starting with a mammogram and, and possible other imaging if indicated, have made a huge impact on breast cancer outcomes. There's no question that it has decreased mortality. So increased cure rate, we see high, a higher cure rate long-term because of um, uh, screening being available with mammograms. Um, and we diagnose these breast cancers earlier, which is huge. Again, less treatment um, involved, less disruptive to their life and their health, and a better chance of it not recurring. So, so by far, um, most breast cancer is diagnosed at an early stage and is diagnosed by mammogram, and that is the majority of breast cancer that I see. And so there's almost 4 million breast cancer survivors in the US. By far, most of those um, are early stage of diagnosis and diagnosed by mammogram. As opposed to later stage diagnosis, um, it's like, well, well, how does the patient find out they have breast cancer if they have a mammogram? It, most of the time, this means that it had to grow or progress enough to cause a symptom. And then you know that it's a more advanced stage if it's, if it's had to grow and progress enough in order to get to the point that a patient has a symptom. So, so we'll see patients with more locally advanced breast cancer when they present a higher stage. They then need more intensive treatment. There's no question there, there's a toxicity associated with that in regards to their underlying health and what they have to go through. Um, and when patients need a, you know, long courses of, of chemotherapy to decrease their risk of recurrence in these settings, um, it, it interferes with their work, of course, and they're not, they're not happy about that. You know, uh, patients' work life is part of their, their daily life, is part of who they are. And when they're taken out of the, the workplace, besides the fact that that's their, their livelihood and how they pay for their health insurance, 
Um, it's hard to be home all day as a cancer patient. It's like it's changing your identity and how they feel. So most patients really want to keep working if they can. So sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. Um, besides uh, kind of speaking to the more advanced stages where they're still curable, patients can also present in an incurable state where perhaps if they had a mammogram a few years prior, this would have been diagnosed sooner and they wouldn't now be incurable. I saw a patient in the hospital in the last two weeks who is otherwise taking great care of her health. She's otherwise very healthy in her 60s um, and did not obtain a mammogram when she felt something abnormal in her breast a few years ago. She said, I thought it went away, and then, uh, but maybe it was coming back. And, and clearly there was something there that she was avoiding the mammogram. And now she's a stage four breast cancer. She is not curable. She's still treatable and can maintain you know, uh, treatment um, over, over time with reasonable quality of life. But there's no doubt that this is a huge change and it's likely what's gonna cause the end of her life in the future. So there's no question that mammograms can make a big impact um, in terms of avoiding that scenario. Um, in regards to prostate cancer, so switching gears um, for men, this is the one cancer that we have a really good um, blood test. Um, I, it's not perfect, but good in terms of screening for prostate cancer. A PSA may be abnormal um, for a man five to 10 years before it would have presented otherwise. Um, so in general, I think there's pretty good uptake of this screening test because it's pretty easy to, to obtain in terms of just having a blood test, not an imaging per se. Um, and there's no question too, that can make a big impact long-term on um, diagnosing earlier, having more options in terms of treatment rather than a later stage with more aggressive treatment. So the second most common lung ca uh, cancer is lung cancer for men and for women. Importantly, this is the highest cause of cancer death in men and women. So this is, this is really a big deal. Um, we know that 90% of lung cancer is related to smoking. So again, I added, you know, preventative health topic and tobacco is just, is hugely important. We know this affects other um, aspects of health, cardiovascular disease, um, COPD, but, but of course, in this case, lung cancer is a really big deal. We have a good screening test for this now. We could not say this 10 years ago. Um, lung cancer in general is diagnosed at a later stage, the majority of the time, over 50% of the time. So when the screening test was studied and found to be effective, this is really important. So, and that screening test is a low dose CAT scan of the chest. This is implemented for patients that are considered higher risk. So that's if you've smoked around a pack a day for 20 years or more. And if you still smoke or you've quit in the last 15 years, they found that if we are able to implement these low dose CTs of the chest, it saves lives. So that's why it was such a good, uh, such a big impact such a good study and, and so worthwhile to try to implement for patients. So um, similar to the way a mammogram works, we're diagnosing breast cancer really, you know, really early or earlier than we would have if we waited till we had a symptom. Same thing for lung cancer. When they did that research, they found it absolutely saved lives. So, um, so I think this one makes a huge impact. It's really important to try to implement that, that screening. And then colon cancer. So colon cancer is the third most common um, cancer in men and women. Um, as well as it's in the top three causes of cancer death. And we have not only a good test to diagnose colon cancer at an early stage in a colonoscopy, but it may be preventative. So these other tests we've talked about are diagnosing early, even better would be to prevent. So a, colon, a colonoscopy could identify if you have an early stage cancer, as well if you have a high risk polyp. And maybe the, the physician doing the colonoscopy just snips that out and you never get cancer even better. So I try to um, talk to patients about that if they're feeling um, reluctant to undergo the colonoscopy because it's a, it's a procedure and you have to drink the prep and all these things are uncomfortable, but it, it sure is worth it as opposed to uh, a later stage colon cancer that could have been cured or prevented. Um, in addition to, they have some other, some other tests now that are less invasive, um, maybe not 100% uh, effective in, in terms of stool tests, but but these are all really worthwhile to talk about with your physician or in these preventative health um, opportunities through, you know, whether that's through um, insurance and such or work. Um, so I, I met a patient this week who is in his uh, mid 60s. He has high blood pressure and diabetes that he's taking care of very well. He works full time as a truck driver for 30 years. And so he, he's, he's really taken pretty good care of himself. He had never had a colonoscopy and he developed abdominal pain and it came, it's coming and going. And finally it, it wasn't resolving. 
and came to the hospital and he had near a near bowel obstruction. So the tumor in his colon had grown enough to block his colon. Um, and so he underwent a, a fairly emergent surgery and they were able to remove it, but they found that it had spread to multiple lymph nodes at that time. So, so his, his cancer stage, as opposed to if he, if he may have had the colonoscopy in the past, maybe he doesn't get cancer or maybe he's in early stage one or two. But at this point, he's a more advanced stage three. So that means he needs he has an indication for chemotherapy for up to six months to decrease his risk of recurrence. That's certainly going to affect his health in regards to side effects. Um, it's going to affect his work schedule. He loves to work. He, he talked about he has no plans to retire. How could he possibly work, you know, while he's going through chemotherapy? So we were going to try to try to work on that with him. Um, so there's no question it's going to affect that part of his life. Um, and in addition, he still has a high risk to recur and have for colon cancer to come back and possibly not be curable. Um, so when we see these patients, you know, I, I always think like, what could we have done to, to try to educate and, and prevent this kind of thing if possible, or at least diagnose at, a, a, at an earlier stage? So I hope that we're um, improving in, in regards to really educating the population, um, educating patients. And, and Dr. Hill had, had mentioned something that, to that extent in terms of um, patient-centered care. You know, like uh, um, it's, it's one thing to get these recommendations, but also want to understand and help patients understand what are the obstacles to us, to them really being able to do this. Um, as an example with mammograms, some of the patients, the, the women that I'll see come in with an advanced breast cancer who did not have a mammogram, they will say, well, I, I thought there was no way I could get breast cancer because I don't have any breast cancer in my family. So I just knew this couldn't happen. Um, and so importantly, you know, we need to know and need to tell patients the risk factors for breast cancer are being a woman and getting older. So that's me. That's every woman I know. Um, it's just common. It's very common. And, um, and so, so hopefully we're, we're, um, we're improving over time with educating and realizing just how valuable cancer screening and preventative health can be. So I will um, switch gears to the preventative health briefly, um, just because I think this is very important. I put cancer prevention plus some, because we talked about all of the other um, aspects of your health that are improved with preventative health, but um, specific to cancer here, tobacco use. So, that, so this really is huge. I think I, I mentioned earlier, 90% of lung cancer is attributable to tobacco use. 30% of cancer deaths come from smoking. So the, imagine if, if we had, if we were able to completely get rid of tobacco use, that we would decrease cancer death by 30%, that would be amazing. So, um, so I, I think this is important. I can tell you when I see patients, I also see you know, benign blood disorders. So if, I'm not, if it's not a cancer diagnosis and I'm seeing a patient for anemia and they smoke, I, I may talk to them about smoking as part of our treatment plan for them and how, what can we do to help them stop as much or more than their anemia, because I think it's gonna make the bigger negative impact on their health long-term. And we have smoking cessation programs, we have medications. Um, so uh, I, it's, it's important for us to continue to try to, to educate and see if we can make the biggest impact on decreasing tobacco use. I, I will say, I feel like I never meet patients anymore that are, are happy about smoking. You know, it's tough because they, they may have wanted to quit and just struggled because it's an addiction. So, um, so I think that's something we can definitely continue to improve in, in terms of preventing cancer and even cancer survivors that have better outcomes if they don't smoke. So I, I continue to talk about that as much as, much as I can. Um, and then obesity, exercise, nutrition, weight, exercise, nutrition. I think this is huge also. There are um, quite a few cancers that are associated with obesity, um, as well as some nutrition habits or, or lack, lack thereof, good nutrition. Um, and for cancer survivorship, I mean, there, there's over 20 million cancer survivors in the United States. And so these uh, obesity and, and, and weight control and exercise and nutrition affect their overall health going forward after cancer diagnosis also. Health-related quality of life is a measure um, that we use now to, in terms of, you know, how is a patient feeling? How are they suffering related to their health? How can we improve that? And it, where we can make a positive impact um, on these aspects, it really, it really um, makes a difference. So I think I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Morange. And thank you, Dr. Hill. Video back on. So um, 
Looks like we do have a couple questions that um, were submitted um, beforehand that either of you um, would be, if either of you would be graciously um, happy to answer. So Dr. Morange, this is really going to be um, to you probably, but do you know, you know, and I know that you spoke about lung cancer as it was, right? And um, who should get the testing and who shouldn't get the testing. Um, can you elaborate on the smokers that get the test or should it really just be smokers who do have, um, get that lung testing or who should be tested? And then do you, are you aware of if insurance does cover um, by the task force that lung cancer screening? Oh, great, that's a, that's a great question. Um, absolutely, lung cancer screening should be covered by insurance. I have not had any situation um, where that I'm aware of that that's not covered. Um, and so the, the original study that made this the standard of care, they looked at patients that this is their criteria, um, starting at the age of 50, okay? If they had smoked 30 pack years, so that means uh, approximately a pack a day for 30 years. And if they were active smokers or if they had quit smoking, but it was within the last 15 years, okay? So those are our criteria to look for people that we knew would benefit from this, um, from low dose CT of the chest to um, try to identify early lung cancers. And then they had further studies that came out. They all continued to be consistent about the benefit of low dose CAT scan. And, and they changed the criteria a little bit, finding that there's benefit for patients that have even smoked less. So if they smoked 20 pack years, so about a pack a day for 20 years, and are either current smokers or smoked in the last 15 years and after the age of 50. So, so that's the current criteria to undergo um, low-dose CT chest. And, and like I mentioned earlier, if I see an anemia patient or another um, benign blood disorder, if they smoke and they haven't had that CT, I'm really trying to get that done. And they have some, they have programs um, in St. Tammany in terms of the specifically for um, uh, lung cancer surveillance with the low-dose CT to make sure like if we get, so, so you get that CT and you get a good result, we still wanna continue that yearly, just like a mammogram. Um, and so that, that um, keep patients on track and, and so that we're not missing. Perfect, thank you. All right, and this is gonna be probably for either of you guys. Um, what do you think a good step is for an employer to take in adapting a wellness strategy for their employees? I guess I'll, <laughs> so um, one of the things I think that I, I can just tell you what we do at St. Tammany. Um, first of all, we not only encourage people to get a wellness visit every year, because that's very important. If they do a wellness visit and do the appropriate screenings, they get a deductible from in their, on their insurance. So there, there's the sparkle beetle that gets people into the doctor's office. Um, everybody on our health plan has a primary care physician and why that is important. And we, we educate on what a primary care physician is because um, sometimes people say, well, I go to a dermatologist and that's very important for skin cancer screenings and other reasons, but they're not a primary care physician. So you have to educate what is appropriate and who is it appropriate to go to for a wellness check and a wellness visit to get all of those things uh, taken care of both for chronic disease screening and management and also for cancer screenings um, so that you can get all of that done in, in one place. So what I would say is um, education is important, incentivize the reason to, to establish a, um, a relationship with a primary care physician, and also make sure that the panel of primary care physicians that you choose um, can show you actual quality and show you a track record that yes, they really do understand um, the necessity of going through all of the different um, screenings. Um, I really, um, no disrespect to any um, specialist, and, and, but you really wanna make sure to get all of your chronic disease management and all of this done. Um, the primary care folks in a well-maintained um, organization with physicians um, know how to do this. If you go to a specialist, they know how to treat maybe a heart issue, but they may not know how to screen and treat um, for diabetes. So you need somebody to quarterback. And I think that the way to do is to make sure you have the right health plan, the right network. Um, and you have to make sure that your patients, when they do get sick, have access um, because you know we don't have a, a, a 
huge number of primary care physicians or providers. So we have to make sure that when you do get sick, you can get to see somebody and don't have to go to the emergency. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Uh, just a few, two quick more questions, um, and this is going to be likely for either of you guys. For um, related to stress, how does stress in you, you all's field, how do you see that affecting the overall health? And then on the latter side of that, do you have any you know, general recommendations of what um, members of the community, employees, employers could do to um, eliminate or decrease such stress? I can talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I think that's an extremely relevant topic. And so especially when patients come here and whether it's a cancer diagnosis or not, and their blood pressure's high and they're very stressed. And, and, and regardless, maybe they end up with without any bad diagnoses or maybe they do, um, you can tell where stress is affecting everything. So I would say, you know, their, their productivity, their, um, how they feel about their outlook on life and their health and anxiety kind of going uh, hand in hand with stress. And so as an example, at least for patients that we take care of here, we talk about stress. We, we, we try to, you know, we try to gauge how stressed a patient is so that we can try to help with that. We talk about mindful meditation and breathing exercises. You know, there, there's research on this from a psychology standpoint, and this affects your physical health in terms of dealing with stress and anxiety and what kind of resources can we help with if, um, if they may not have those. So I, I think stress is kind of uh, integrally entwined um, in patients' health. And there's always the question, or I've had patients say, I was so stressed, that's, that's why I got this cancer. You know, we don't know, we don't know exactly about these connections, but do, do we, can we, uh, I think, connect some health outcomes to stress? And do I think it matters? Yes, I do, I do think it matters. I, I think that's perfectly said, Genevieve. I, I agree. I think certainly there is a connection between stress and health outcomes. Um, and I, I think that's certainly important to, to look at that. And I think underneath stress, you got to figure out what the drivers are. Um, some of it may be depression. So I think there's a, we think that 30 to 40% of patients either have one depressive episode within, you know, within 10 years. Uh, and some people have chronic depression. And I think you've got to figure, you got to get that out. Then there's episodic stress that comes on from work or other things, external forces. And I think it's important to train folks how to deal with stress in their own lives. And one of the things I've told people, and honestly, um, social media is a huge driver of stress. Um, keeping the news on all day long is a huge driver of stress because it's, it's a constant barrage of negative news. And you, you, can't, you can't get that all the time, filter it out and, and, and feel good about things. I will say the other thing from an employer point of view um, you may want to develop a program that actually will go in with a psychologist or behavioral health specialist. It could be a social worker that can actually meet with your staff individually and confidentially to discuss any issues, they, life issues they may be having um, to try to work through. And then certainly if you have a, a, a certain something that happens within the organization, maybe a death of a coworker or something else that the entire organization is involved with, then you've got to really pull in resources and really deal with that uh, from a macro level. So I think there, as Dr. Moran says, there's individual training, um, there's counseling that you could bring into the organization, and make it easy for people to um, see somebody and, and connect to resources. And then the final thing is, if you've got a huge thing that over the entire organization, then you may want to uh, bring in more resources into the organization for the um, for any issues that may arrive um, as a reaction to something that happened in the workplace. Excellent. And then the final question that we have would be, um, can either of you give examples on what someone can do to reduce their risk for cardiovascular disease? Okay, Dr. I'll Dr. take this to start with, but um, chime in because, you know, whatever, Dr. Morange uh, trained in internal medicine also, so she knows all. I think the main thing is um, uh, cardiovascular disease is directly related to hypertension. So number one, you want to get good blood pressure control. And um, we used to think that uh, good plus blood pressure control was less than 140 over 90. 
We now know there's something called prehypertension, even before you get to um, something greater than 120 over 80. So a lot of that is diet control, weight control, and when necessary, medication. So I'd say number one cause of heart disease throughout, other than genetic, because there is a genetic component, it is hypertension. Uh, second is uh, dietary, um, eating too much, too much uh, uh, red meat, uh, processed uh, meat, not getting exercise. I think nutrition is directly related uh, and exercise are directly related to heart disease. And then um, finally, I'd say, uh, even when you do all that, um, hyperlipidemia, that is high cholesterol um, and, and high triglycerides can also in certain cases lead to uh, plaque buildup uh, in the coronary arteries causing less blood flow to go to parts of the heart and can cause heart disease or even a heart attack. So those are the, the kind of things that we, we, we kind of focus on. And again, early treatment of hypertension um, is, is really needed because when the heart is stressed with a lot of high blood pressure, the muscle actually thickens. Now we think a thickened muscle is a healthy muscle, but the heart, it actually turns out when the heart muscle becomes too, um, too big, it actually becomes less efficient in, in pumping. And then people develop in, uh, congestive heart failure and cardiovascular disease. And the, the one thing I would add, just mentioning something you referenced also, but that I think benefits everything we've talked about. And my poor patients know I, I talk about this every day is exercise. Every cancer type we talked about, there's research now for exercise while patients are on cancer treatment for better outcomes as cancer survivors, to prevent cardiovascular disease, to manage stress. I, I, and it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about running marathons, you know, starting out with moving, moving 10 minute walks a day. I've had, I've seen patients have just amazing success with kind of improving their health and their overall well being with just starting small with walking. And then we, we help them and support them, you know, building up from that. I think exercise is huge. Excellent. Um, and and I would just add one other thing. I thought you were going to say this, Jennifer, because I forgot. Uh, smoking. Definitely don't oh, want to yeah, be smoking. Yeah. That's, a, that's a huge driver for not only lung cancer, but yeah. coronary disease yeah. and heart disease. Excellent. Well, thank you both. And that concludes today's session. So we want to thank each of you again who joined us um, and for your ongoing commitment to the, not only just the Live Better Committee, and the, but the St. Tammany Chamber as well. And again, thank you, Dr. Mirage and Dr. Hill for a great uh, topic today. I appreciate it.